scrap metal and 40% physical. Math was never our strong suit, but breaking down Ohio State football is. Sit back and join us for Buckeye Grove Instant Access, part of the Unscripted Ohio Podcast Network. You can do it! Brought to you by BuckeyeGrove.com. Post-game thoughts, immediate analysis, and much, much more to put the big game into perspective. Without any further delay of game, here's your host, Kevin New. Kevin, God damn it. Hey, welcome to the BIA Podcast. I am your host, Kevin New, and you are listening to the Buckeye Grove Instant Access Podcast, BIA. And before we get into anything, I want to bring my co-host in, Griffin Strom, who's our excellent team writer here at Buckeye Grove. Griffin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Noon. And this show is kind of a special request. We don't get, we, we get asked a lot of questions, but there's not a question we are asked more going into the 21 season than what's going on at linebacker. I mean, I, I guess a close second is the back end in terms of the secondary, but Linebacker this, linebacker that. So, you know, you asked, we're bringing it here. We're going to talk 100% of this show about linebacker. I'm going to try and shorten it up a little. We've been getting about 35, 40 minutes on some of these shows. Uh, as people start going back to work and having drives and want to listen to some stuff in the car, I get it. But most people don't have 40 minutes to dedicate to a show. So we're going to try and keep this one moving a little quicker. But we'll see as we go. So instead of me blathering on... uh. Ohio State obviously loses its four top linebackers in terms of production and all of that good stuff. I mean, you lose Tuff Borland, Pete Werner, Baron Browning, Justin Hilliard. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I don't have the PFF snap counts in front of me at the moment, but I would venture to say that is almost the entire bulk of all the snaps that linebackers took outside of maybe quote unquote garbage time. Yeah, sorry. Um, and I, I actually just pulled up the snap counts here uh, so we can get a kind of a, a definitive look at that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, outside of, of Justin Hilliard, uh, Tuff Borland, and Baron Browning, um, and who's the one I missed there, obviously? Pete uh, Warner. Pete Warner, Baron Browning, Tuff Borland, and Justin Hilliard. Nobody else even played 100 snaps last season, and um, all those uh, aforementioned four guys there played at least uh, 231, which is what Hilliard played. The, those other guys are up in the 300s and 400s. Um, so, you know, even a guy like uh, Taraja Mitchell was the, the next highest um, after that four. He, he didn't even play 100 snaps last year. Um, so that goes to show, you know, just how much Ohio State relied on that core four guys. Um, and, you know, last year, I don't, I don't think anyone could have expected Justin Hilliard to come on as strong as he did at the end of the season um, and, you know, and, and propelled himself into – um, you know, comp- the the chance to, to compete for an NFL team uh, this offseason here to make a team. And, um, yeah, those are just uh, four guys, you know, super reliable, left years and years of starting experience, um, especially you're looking at a tough Borland. I mean, he was around, you know, you're talking about guys that have been there for five, six years. Um, you know, Pete Warner and Baron Browning, guys that played multiple positions. Um, you're talking about versatility. Um, and, and, yeah, now you're looking at it, you know, you're not just replacing one starter. You're not just replacing two starters. You're replacing three starters, four starters, really, because, um, you know, when Browning went down um, with some COVID issues and whatnot, you know, Justin Hilliard filled right in for him at that stem spot. Um, that's a ton of experience you're losing, and that's obviously why um, it is such a big question of, of what's going on with linebackers this season for a hot state. And then you throw into the mix the fact that is Ohio State really changing its defensive scheme? I mean, we, you know, they'll have a will, they'll have a mic, and then they'll have a bullet maybe. I mean, we've talked about the bullet in previous years. Pete Warner kind of negated the need for a bullet because he just didn't come off the field with his skill set. So Ohio State, you know, long on talent, maybe short on experience, and then just to throw it into the mix, maybe changing how things are schematically done a little bit? Yeah, and, and if you look at last year, um, and really the last couple of years, right, uh, but specifically last year, what was the strength of the Ohio State defense? It was stopping the run. It was, the, you know, the, that interior of the defensive line with Togi, um, with Haskell Garrett, and obviously the, 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 the linebacker plays well in terms of shutting down the run. Ohio State had one of the best, uh, you know, run defenses in the country. Um, the problem obviously lied in the pass defense, and um, 
you know, obviously the, the, the defensive backs and, and, you know, Sean Wade took a lot of heat um, for that. You know, you look at, a, you know, Marcus Hooker as well, a guy that was kind of, uh, you know, much maligned um, for, for some of the, the mistakes he kind of made in the Indiana game, uh, the seventh and third. And so, you know, how do, how do you remedy that without, you know, completely, um, you know, changing the, the entire system that they're, they're uh, you know, implemented there on the house State defense? And one way is, you know, looking at doing something different with that third linebacker, obviously. And that's what, you know, Kerry Combs talked about at the end of um, – after the spring – a week after the spring game. You know, um, if you only have two linebackers and, you know, you add another, um, you know, defensive back or whether that be a hybrid like we're talking about, um, obviously that is to uh, kind of become more proficient in shutting down and opposing uh, pass attack. And, you know, in the Big Ten for a lot of years, um, you know, obviously that, that's a, a conference that's been, you know, predicated on being able to run the ball and stop the run and things of that nature. But as we've seen in this past year, um, you know, Big Ten offenses are evolving. So like a, a team like Indiana suddenly has a, you know, a, fly, uh, um, a high flying pass attack and maybe in years past, and maybe even in 2019, um, Ohio State didn't have to, to contend with those types of um, pass offenses. Um, but last year, you kind of saw the evolution of the Big Ten in terms of teams being able to pass the ball. And then obviously, once you get to the next level of college football, the elite teams, um, the, you know, Clemson's and Alabama's, um, Ohio State just had no answer for that Alabama pass attack. And so that's why you're seeing um, some experimentation um, with Ohio State this year and moving a Craig Young um, to bullet and, and having Ronnie Hickman, who you previously thought would have been, you know, a, a nickel defensive back or, or a safety or whatever, um, him being listed as a bullet. Court Williams is, is the third guy that, that Combs mentioned um, as a guy that's going to be uh, playing that bullet as well. Obviously, he's on the men from an ACL tear. So we saw more of that in the spring game. And um, who knows how much of it we will see, but it definitely seems like something that, that will be more of a legitimate um, schematic change for a high state this season. You're listening to the BIA Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Noon, joined by Griffin Stroman. We are talking linebackers, linebackers, and only linebackers here in this episode of the show. Um, Ohio State has a talented class from a couple of years ago with Taraja Mitchell, Kayvon Pope, Dallas Gant, who really have not been able to break through. You know, we talk about log jams on a depth chart. The four linebackers that have been that departed after this season certainly created a log jam. But then you throw in guys like Cody Simon, Tommy Eichenberg. I mean, I could go on and on. True freshman Reed Carrico. Maybe he could step into something. You don't know. What, you know, what, what is, you know, how are the, the pieces going to fit in these other two spots and this, this will and this mic, as we've kind of talked about who seems to be destined to be a bullet. Uh, you know, you see guys like Taraja who comes in and maybe is like the fifth linebacker. You see Dallas Gant who might be the fifth linebacker based on last year's team. You would think that they seem to be at least clubhouse leaders to be the starters at Will and Mike respectively, but I don't think anything is for certain. Yeah, and that, that comes back to the whole question of, you know, if some of these guys had logged, you know, major uh, snap counts in seasons past, then maybe you could look at um, a, a guy like Dallas Gant and say, okay, he's, he, uh, you know, missed this spring with injury, but, you know, he'll just come right in and start right away. Maybe you could say that if these guys had some more experience in the past, but the fact is that they do not. And um, so that's why you've seen a guy like Cody Simon got a ton of time this spring with a, the first team defense. Um, and, you know, that's a really, another really talented guy, um, just a second year guy. Uh, but he got a ton of time um, alongside Taraja Mitchell uh, playing those two inside linebacker spots. Um, I think that's a guy that, you know, is going to benefit from um, some of the injuries in that linebacker group for Ohio State this spring um, because he got, you know, so many more reps. Um, you're looking at, at Gant and also Mitchell Melton are two, are two uh, linebackers that, you know, would be in the mix that, that uh, missed the spring. But still, you know, just because, uh, you know, Gant, Mitchell, and Pope, those are the three senior senior guys, um, you know, with Gant and Mitchell, you know, being the, the, the inside uh, uh, backers of, that, of those uh, three. And, um, you know, Taraja Mitchell, I think, is, is really obviously trending to be um, a starter. When you look at Dallas Gant, you know, I still tend to think that with him being a senior, um, you know, and, and other guys behind him, you know, they still have some time. Cody Simon, um, obviously a Tommy Eichenberg, who's probably playing that middle, middle position as well. Um, those guys still have you know, years ahead of them. Um, for a guy like Dallas Gant, um, 
I still would think, you know, he probably, unless, you know, his injury issues or his uh, his ankle or foot injury is kind of worse um, than we think. I still tend to think that he'll probably end up, you know, working his way to a starting role um, because it really is that year for those guys, for those three guys. It's their senior year. They've been waiting so long to really get their, their shot. Um, so it would surprise me, you know, if Dallas Gann didn't have a pretty big role because he's gotten, you know, right, right alongside Taraj and Mitchell, even though they haven't got a ton of snaps the last few, a couple of seasons. Those have been the guys that have been, you know, second on the on the depth chart at a couple of those positions. And I can hear people listening to the show right now. What about a transfer? What about a transfer? We'll get to that in the second segment, I promise. But um, you know, the I think the issue that Ohio State faces as well is it doesn't get to start the season with Columbus State, Bucyrus Barber College. I mean, it's at Minnesota and then home against Oregon. And you know, Minnesota does have a bit of a running game. Uh, you know, Oregon probably doesn't have uh, LeGarrette Blunt or anybody on the roster right now, but you're not going to get a chance to really go to the lab and try and experiment and, and see what is going on in no pressure, no leverage situations. There's gonna there's gonna be there's gonna be some high leverage situations, even if Ohio State's favored by couple scores against Minnesota and probably double digits against Oregon. Uh, you know, they're going to have to really figure some things out once they get to fall practice here come uh, into July, early August. Yeah, and, and that's exactly why, even if you are very confident in the talent of these guys, this next crop of linebackers that's, you know, going to be stepping into these starting roles for Ohio State, even so, I think that's why Ohio State has been looking at, you know, some of these experienced guys um, in the portal um, to potentially bring in, uh, you know, so that you kind of have somebody with a little more experience in that group because you just, uh, you know, flat out don't have that experience. And when you're uh, starting the season, you know, when you're starting the season with Minnesota, a a legitimate Big Ten team, um, I think you want a little bit more of that, even if it's a guy that's coming from, you know, outside the conference. Exactly. And I think that's a perfect segue for us to take our break. On the other side, we'll come back and we'll talk about the transfer portal, one that got away and one that seems to be trending in the right direction. All that more coming up here on the BIA podcast. Egg Water Conditioning has been treating well in city water in central Ohio with American-made water filtration products for over 60 years. Have a water quality problem? The water treatment experts at Hague know how to solve it. Not sure if your water softener is working? They will test, inspect, and sanitize any brand of water softener for only $20. Schedule a system checkup or water test today by calling 614-836-2195 or visit them online at hagueh2o.com. That's H-A-G-U-E-H-2O.com. Welcome back to the BIA podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Noon, joined by Griffin Strom, and we are talking linebackers and only linebackers. And uh, this next section is sponsored by... Alex, I need a vowel. I mean, it, I mean, with a couple of uh, Polynesian uh, linebackers that we're going to be talking about here, I spent the I spent thirty minutes going into the show practicing names. The first one I've been down on because it looked like that was what was going to happen. The second one, it's been a crash crash course. But let's start with Henry Toto, the former Tennessee linebacker. Everything seems to be trending in the right direction. And then all of a sudden it's not, he ends up, uh, committing to Alabama. I can give a little bit of the recruiting backstory there. He picked Tennessee over Alabama, certainly had a bit of regret in that decision. While I think he probably saw, I mean, certainly his family saw a, uh, a little bit more of a clearer path to the field. Uh, at Ohio State, I I think Henry was not going to miss at a second chance to bite at that Alabama apple. Uh, it's certainly not going to be a clean path for him at Alabama. There's nothing saying that anything would have been given to him 100% at Ohio State, but uh, you know certainly a shock for a lot of Ohio State fans because the news coming out of the Toto camp was this one was going to be all Buckeyes. Yeah, we'd certainly been hearing the, you know, rumblings that, you know, that might be, you know, something of a, a sure bet for Ohio State. Um, but there had also been some other stuff floating around that, that maybe his uh, his dad had wanted him to stay in the, uh, or that his dad had said that he was interested in staying in the SEC. Um, so yeah, you look at a guy like that, um, and, and Toto actually, 
you know, he was a true freshman in 2019. Um, so theoretically, he would have less experience than, you know, some of these uh, fourth-year guys that Ohio State has on the inside. Um, but that's actually not the case. I mean, he, he had 72 total tackles as a true freshman um, and five tackles for loss. I mean, that type of production um, at that early stage of his career, I mean, that's just something that um, even if Roger Mitchell, who, you know, the, you know, top, you know, uh, overall prospect five-star guy, he has not, you know, broken through the ranks like that um, at Ohio State. And obviously the, the caliber of, uh, you know, the linebacking uh, cores between those two programs are obviously uh, different. Um, but still, I mean, a guy that that was able to do uh, what, what Toa Toa was able to do that early on, I mean, and if you have a chance at a guy like that for Ohio State with the lack of experience you have in your linebacking core, um, you know, obviously you want to bring that guy in if you're Al Washington. Um, however, I mean, is anybody really all that surprised that that, that a guy like Toa Toa is going to end up at Alabama? Um, I really don't think so. Even, uh, you know, despite the fact that we were hearing, you know, uh, stuff that he was going to come to Ohio State, at the end of the day, Man, I mean, what can you say? Alabama just, you know, brings in, you know, top tier talent, whether it's, uh, you know, recruiting, whether it's in the, in the uh, transfer portal, as we're seeing, um, here this offseason, you know, you also look at the, the Jameson Williams thing, um, with Ohio State. Um, so Alabama's got a couple, a couple of, uh, you know, proverbial wins here over Ohio State this offseason. Um, just kind of an interesting dynamic there. Um, but yeah, I think honestly losing out on Toa Toa for Ohio State, um, it's not the biggest deal in the world, I don't think. And obviously, we're, we're talking about another guy that um, that could potentially, you know, fill that slot for Ohio State in the transfer portal. Um, but I think even still, I mean, you're still confident um, in the talent that you have a linebacker if you're Ohio State, even if it, it doesn't have the, the experience or, or it's not the proven commodity that Toe Toe um, would have been coming in. I was going to say, does Ohio State need Toe Toe to be competitive in the Big Ten? No. Does Ohio State need Toe Toe to – get into the college football playoff? Probably not. Does Ohio State, you know, it's it's kind of a luxury move, but we have seen Ohio State in the playoff the last two years. I mean, certainly Ohio State's one of the teams that is always in the mix for making the playoff. It, it certainly would have helped, and it certainly would have helped to keep Toto away from Alabama. And Ohio State has had success in the portal with guys like Justin Fields, Trey Sermon, Jonah Jackson. I mean, we can go with that, you know, with that list. So it's not like Ohio State is unable to pull guys there. Uh, you know, I think when Ohio State went out and got Justin Fields, that was an absolute must get type of situation. I think to a lesser extent, going out and getting Jonah Jackson, and I know we're getting away from linebackers, sue me. Uh, you know, going out and getting uh, Jonah Jackson was kind of a must get because they needed that type of leadership guy somebody who'd done it, an all Big Ten performer, and they were able to plug him in. Going out and getting a experienced linebacker, I think in a lot of ways, fills some of the role the way that Jonah Jackson did, um, at least to a certain extent. Don't you agree? Yeah, and, you know, it, it's honestly like if Ohio State doesn't end up getting, um, you know, somebody, um, you know, whether it be, you know, the next guy we're probably going to start talking about here, um, if you look back now, it, you think about like Eli Ricks, for example, um, a guy that, you know, a lot of people thought uh, might come to Ohio State, you know, to fill a need um, in that defensive, uh, in, in the secondary. And then you look at, at a couple other guys, if Ohio State loses out on a couple other of these big time transfers, it, it would actually almost be surprising to look at in, in totality and be like, okay, Ohio State really has had a lot of success with landing guys that um, in spots that they could really use them. Uh, the guys you just talked about, obviously, Jonah Jackson. Um, Justin Fields, Trey Sermon, um, you know, that's, that's very w within reason for a program like Ohio State to pull guys um, when there are some uh, out of the portal, when there are some questions about a specific uh, position group. Um, and while I don't think they necessarily need uh, these, these, these pair of linebackers we're, we're talking about or an Eli Ricks necessarily, I mean, it would definitely help Ohio State's uh, cause on a defense that, that has a ton of questions in the back end. And that brings us to the player that they could be landing. And here we go. And we're going to call him by his nickname moving after. I feel pretty confident. I'm going to, I'm going to get this one right. Pala EA, not Ote Ote. A former five-star out of Bishop Gorman High School, Las Vegas, was at USC, has dealt with some injury concerns during his career, Got uh, had his season shortened last year after two games with, uh, with concussion uh symptoms he went into the portal before the year is over there's been a knee injury in there as well 
still about a hundred tackles during his career. Uh, you know, a big guy. I mean, he, he's, I mean, he's, you know, we're not talking like Noah Sewell at like 250, but we're still talking about a big linebacker who projects well as like a Mike. Uh, his nickname is EA. So we're going to call him EA from here on out, unless Griffin wants to take a swing at it. But Pala EA, Naote Ote. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm not even going to attempt it, to be honest with you. Uh, once I start seeing, you know, Gs that are actually pronounced like Ns, um, you know, that, that's just a territory that I, that, that's not my expertise. Um, but, you know, you talk about uh, EA. Um, he's actually, uh, and you talk about Bishop Gorman as well. He's actually Haskell Garrett's cousin, I believe I read um, in his little bio uh, for USC earlier. So that certainly can't, uh, you know, hurt things with the Ohio State, potential Ohio State connection. Um you know, there have been a lot of rumors about him potentially going to the uh, Pac-12, him potentially going to Texas. But it seems like, you know, since uh, Toho Toho has officially gone to Alabama, um, that Ohio State might be focusing, refocusing their efforts on bringing in uh, EA here um, after some initial, um, you know, conversations back when he entered the transfer portal. Um, maybe they focus their attentions a little bit more on Toho Toho um, in recent months as, you know, as we started to believe that, that he might go to Ohio State. Um, but it seems like now, before any final decisions are made, um, that Ohio State's really going to uh, try to make a, a last-ditch uh, push here um, for EA in, in, in a similar spot, you know, bringing in an, uh, an experienced inside, linebacking, uh, inside linebacker um, that's obviously got years of experience, even if he's coming off of some injury issues. Right, and I think when you sit there and you look at EA, it's not necessarily a situation that he comes in and he locks down that spot, and that's his, and nobody else is going to get the mic position. I think it provides some depth. I think he certainly gets the opportunity. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a matter of getting your best 11 out there, what's going to work. And uh, if he ends up being a, a, a Justin Hilliard fourth linebacker, so be it. I mean, I think it, it's a good decision if they're able to make this happen. You, you know, you always – you always ask the question when you bring in somebody from the outside, are you going to lose your locker room? Are you going to lose, are you going to lose the room because guys have waited their turn or, or whatnot? But you say that in, in one breath and then the next breath you say, it's all about opportunity. You have to go out there and seize that opportunity. You have to seize that moment. And if you're not able to seize it away from somebody else, I mean, because I guarantee you, they're not bringing somebody in and saying, here you go. Here's the keys to the Woody. Uh, here's Ryan Day's parking spot. Here you go. You're getting everything. I mean, you're going to have to get out there, and you're going to have to earn it. Yeah, and, you know, would it suck for, you know, a Dallas Gann or a Trojan Mitchell, um, you know, or a Kayvon Pope for that matter, to, you know, get to their, their fourth year, you know, the, the, the deck is cleared, uh, if you will. You know, they, they've got, you know, in, in prime position to, to secure a starting spot. And then for them, you know, another guy comes in with more experience, um, equal talent, and, you know, beats them out. Would that suck for them? Yes, it definitely would. But also for Ohio State, um, you're not talking about bringing a guy in from the outside that's going to um, supplant, you know, a pre a guy that started in, in seasons past. Because as we talked about, um, those guys just aren't, you know, these guys are, are going to be brand new starters no matter what for Ohio State. Um, <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, even, you know, just this spring, you see a couple of injuries in a, in a, you know, in a position group and suddenly you've got a damn uh, long snapper out there, a linebacker for Ohio State. So, um, you know, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with Ohio State, you know, trying to get um, some depth at linebacker when you when you have all these questions surrounding the position um, in the first place, and uh, it, it, it you just feel uh, you know sec more secure with your group if you can bring in a guy, um, you know, with a five star recruiting pedigree, uh, a proven commodity, um, and a guy that's that's gonna you know definitely be in the mix and, and definitely play a lot of snaps um, even if he's rotating um, in with a couple other guys. And there you go. And, and, you know, again, I'm like, oh, we're going to go 15, 20 minutes. We're at about 25. Uh, but I want to give Griffin one more chance. Anything in summation that we maybe didn't get to? Just, you know, final thoughts on linebackers. I promise you this is not going to be the last time we're going to talk about this position. Uh, I, I, I guarantee it because we're going to keep being asked about it. I'm going to refer to this podcast. But, you know, if Ohio State does go to the, por the portal and does land EA, you know, certainly going to be something to talk about there. But any final thoughts? Yeah, my final thought or just kind of a question that I have is, you know, uh, where exactly does Kayvon Pope fit into things? Because, um, you know, we already talked about, you know, the, those three seniors um, with Gant and Mitchell being the two inside guys and then Pope 
would he be the you know theoretical the, the Sam of the of the bunch? Um, but with Ohio State, you know, moving towards that that bullet position, does that kind of put him in a weird spot? Um, and you know, just a couple of years ago, like he had a he he made a, a couple you know big plays in, in some uh, you know the end of some blowout games. Like a, I think he had two interceptions in like uh, two or three weeks or something like that um, in 2019. And, and he kind of looked he was uh, you know making plays out there um, at the end of games. And then last year he really didn't ha- he didn't get a ton of snaps last year. And this year you kind of look at him and you're like, where exactly does he fit in if Ohio State's moving more towards this bullet um, position with guys like Craig Young and, and Ronnie Hickman? Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that situation plays out. He's kind of a guy that seems to a little, be getting, you know, lost in the, the shuffle a little bit in comparison to some of, some of the other guys. It'll be something fun to watch, but, you know, that's why we're all here. That's why you're all, you know, proud listeners of the BIA podcast. Hopefully all of you are members at BuckeyeGrove.com. And I want to thank everybody for being a part of this. Griffin, I want to thank you for being part of the show. We're going to be doing these more frequently. We went out to lunch earlier this week and said we have got to do more podcasts. So that is our plan. I'm going to stick by it. So great talk as always. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And again, thank you for listening. We will be back here with you very soon. Once again, I'm Kevin. That's Griffin. We're here for the BIA podcast. Thanks and have a great day. Be sure to stay up to date with Buckeye Grove Instant Access when the news breaks or after the big game. Exclusively at BuckeyeGrove.com or anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher as part of the Unscripted Ohio Podcast Network. Hit that subscribe button so you can stay in the know and never miss a single episode. watching be sure to click on that subscribe button so you don't miss a single thing come visit us over at buckeyegrove.com for all the best ohio state information on the web